Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on life saving drugs 24 hours in AE. We're really, really pleased to have so many of you with us today online. Um, and apologies to anyone who uh, may have just witnessed some of our technical issues. Um, thanks for rejoining us. We really do hope you're going to enjoy today's lecture. It's a really exciting one. Um, and my name is Jacob Brown. I'm going to be hosting the session today. And I'll be joined by Professor Emma Baker, who will be delivering the lecture. Professor Baker is a professor of the clinical pharmacology and course co-director of the BSc in clinical pharmacology at St. George's University of London. She's a clinical academic who works both as a consultant doctor in the NHS and as an academic in the university conducting clinical research and clinical trials. Professor Baker, would you like to pop onto our screen to just say hello to everyone? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much. And we're also lucky enough to have Ekri joining us today, who is a third year clinical, clinical pharmacology student um, and she's going to be in the background helping to answer some of your questions. Ekri, do you want to pop on and say hello? Hi, uh, I'll be here to answer any questions about uh, my time on the course or just about student life and drugs in general. Thanks so much, Ekri. So throughout today's lecture, we will be asking you several questions and asking you to interact. Um, so please do either use the question box on, box on your screen to talk to us, um, or if we put a poll on screen, so you can click on one of the options um, using your mouse. We also encourage you to think about any questions you might have about the lecture or the clinical pharmacology course itself, and pop these in the box on your screen. If we do have time at the end of the event, we'll be putting some of those questions to Professor Baker. Um, but if we run out of time, we'll also make sure that no question goes unanswered and we'll come back to you with an answer by email in the next few days. And just a final point before we kick things off is to let you all know that this lecture is being recorded today and you will be sent a recording of this event within 24 hours after, the, after we finish. So just to start off today, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to St George's. We are the UK specialist health university and we share a site with St George's Hospital which makes us really distinctive as a medical university. We were established in 1752 and we have over 250 years experience in health science education, training and research. St George's Hospital was originally located near Hyde Park in central London and you can see the black and white photos on the left hand side of your screen that show this. But in the 80s, we moved to Tooting in southwest London, which are shown in the colour photos on the right hand side of the screen. Now here you can see St George's today, but you might already be familiar with um, the campus if you have ever watched 24 Hours in A&E on Channel 4, which is filmed at St George's Hospital. Our students are immersed in a healthcare setting, and we really do see this as a benefit to our students. We've got a number of facilities on site on our campus, such an extensive library, an on-site dissection room, a pathology museum, a student union bar, and dance studios, to name just but a few. If you'd like to find out more about the university or about our facilities, please do visit our website for more information on that. So today's lecture is going to be providing you with a taste of what it's like to study on our clinical pharmacology BSc course. This is a three-year degree, which will give you a holistic view of how medicines are developed and used in healthcare, all the way through from understanding the disease process and how drugs work, and testing new medicines in clinical trials to treating patients to improve and save lives. If you enjoyed today's lecture and want to find out more about the course, we'd recommend that you visit the website and look at the course details pages here you can see recent recordings of our Introduction to Clinical Pharmacology webinar, where our subject specialists share their insights about the course and more information about the opportunities it presents. I also wanted to share with you a quote from one of our students on the course. And I think what Maisha highlights here really is the varied amount of teaching styles that students on that course experience. And those include interactive lectures, workshops, hospital and pharmacy visits, 
lab and dissection rooms, plus many more. Alongside the wonderful knowledge, uh, sorry, wonderful knowledgeable academics that you will be taught by on that course. And on that note, that leads us lovely through to the main focus of our event today, where I'm going to hand over to one of those academics, Professor Emma Baker, who will be taking us through the lecture, Life Saving Drugs, 24 Hours in A&E. Emma, I will just pass you control now. Thank you, Jacob, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen now and just check with um, Jacob that I'm sharing the right screen. That looks brilliant. Brilliant. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the topic of life-saving drugs, 24 hours in A&E. You've heard already that St George's has been the site for 24 hours in A&E, and some of you may have watched it and seen all the patients coming in and being treated there. <clears throat> what we're going to concentrate on today, though, is life-threatening emergencies and look at how drugs can be used to save life. So by the end of this session, I'm hoping that you, first of all, will be able to identify a wide range of possible careers in healthcare and science that might interest you. You should be able to describe the pathology and clinical features of two life-threatening emergencies, and I will explain what these words mean as we go along. Anything in italics, I'm going to explain. Sorry, in, um, yeah, in speech marks, I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain what pharmacodynamics is, that's how drugs work, and pharmacokinetics is, which is how the body handles drugs, and show how important it is that we understand that when we're treating patients in A&E. And then we're going to look at how new medicines are developed and introduced into healthcare. And finally, uh, you hopefully by the end will be able to explain what clinical pharmacology is. But first, I need to introduce you to the A&E team of which you guys are becoming a virtual uh, set of members for today. Here's some of our staff at St George's outside the Accident and Emergency Department. Uh, and I'm sure many of you will already know, or all of you should already know, that there are careers for you out there, such as being a doctor or being a nurse. You may be less familiar, though, with a wide range of other staff who are also on the front line and for whom we've all been clapping over the pandemic. Some of you might have heard of physiotherapists who are um, practitioners who work through exercise and movement to heal patients. And you may also be thinking about a career in pharmacy, uh, a career dispensing and using medicines and making sure that patients get the best medicines. But you may be less aware that you could also become a healthcare scientist, somebody who, for example, is doing all the cardiac tests and the breathing tests and the nerve tests that help us make diagnosis, or a radiographer, someone who is taking the x-rays that you've maybe had yourself if you broke a wrist or hurt yourself playing sport. And of course, there are a whole load of other people uh, responsible for making sure A&E works well. The first person you meet when you come into A&E is the receptionist, who's responsible for all the documentation and uh, administration of the department, and the porters, who will take you somewhere if you need to go, or bring, fetch and carry and make the whole hospital work, and the managers in the background who are making things work. But what you might be less aware of is that and the treatments that we understand that we use in A&E have to come from somewhere. And if you like, there's a whole other virtual hidden team that you'll be less aware of, uh, of people working away in the background to develop medicines, get them into healthcare, and make sure that they're used properly uh, for the benefit of patients. And so there's a whole raft of careers out there in universities like me teaching. I'm also a doctor in the NHS. Um, working in pharmaceutical companies to develop new medicines. You'll have heard of that recently with COVID and the new vaccines and drugs coming through. Uh, these things called contract research organisations, delivering all the trials to test the drugs. And they're also being tested in NHS research facilities. And there's a whole range of exciting careers developing new medicines, maybe working with um, approval bodies, like you might have heard of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, who approved our vaccines, working for NICE, I'll tell you a bit about them later on, and also perhaps working in uh, NHS uh, England, who are the strategic body who make sure our NHS runs well. 
So if you think you're interested in science and you like a bit of patient care, but you're not sure if you want the hot shifts of the A&E department, there's a whole range of careers for you out there in science uh, that can be in this space. And I'm going to show you some of those uh, pieces of work. But first, of course, we have to see our first patient because we are now the virtual A&E team on shift. And our first patient uh, is Lydia. And Lydia is 16 and she's collapsed while she's been eating her dinner. And when we assess a, a collapsed patient, we do the ABC. We look at their airway, their breathing and their circulation. And you might have done that if you've learned to do basic life support. So when um, the A&E team, including us, arrive, we look at her. Uh, she's come by ambulance. She is breathing, but she's got very swollen lips and a swollen tongue. And this is starting to block her breathing tubes and making it hard for her to get air into her body. Her breathing is, is going, but it's wheezy, which means it's making a squeaky noise. Many of you might have heard a wheeze before if you have an asthmatic friend. Uh, and she's wearing an oxygen mask that the ambulance staff have put on her. So she's breathing, but she's struggling. And then we look at her circulation. Is the blood flowing well? And she's got, we feel her pulse, feel her wrist, and you can feel that it's very fast, but it's weak. And the um, team take her blood pressure, which is low, and she's very clammy and sweaty and pale. But she's also uh, got a skin rash. Uh, and the skin rash is blotchy and red and can sometimes be known as hives. So that's Lydia. Now I'm going to take you on to our first poll. What I'd like you to do, um, hopefully I can do this, is I'd like you to vote on what you think most likely um, is wrong. So I'd like you to tell me whether you think she's having an allergic reaction or an asthma attack. She's choking. Does she having a heart attack? Uh, or does she have a punctured lung? What do you think, team? Um, I see how many of you can vote. So I've got about 20% have voted so far. Uh, the A&E team are needing your help to try and get to the bottom of what might be wrong with Lydia. I'll just give you another 30 seconds to vote. Do you think it's allergic reaction, asthma attack? You can see they're in alphabetical order. Choking, heart attack or punctured lung. Great, so nearly everyone has voted. We've got 10 seconds till the poll closes. Okay, I'm closing the poll. Thank you for 85% of you who voted. And I'm hoping you can now see the poll results. Jacob, can everybody see that? Yeah, we can see that the most picked item there was an allergic reaction at 75%. Brilliant. So I can see already that we have the future of the NHS safe in our hands. Uh, the uh, three quarters of you felt this was an allergic reaction, which is in fact what is happening. And we'll talk you through that in a minute. A few people thought asthma, which is a good suggestion as well with her being wheezy. And it's a type of allergic reaction. I think that the people who thought choking it's also a really good thought. We want to worry about her windpipe if she's making squeaky noises and can't breathe. And a punctured lung or a heart attack are also reasonable possibilities. Because she's so young at 16, a heart attack is less likely. It's more likely in older patients, as we'll discuss later. Brilliant. So I'm going to hide that poll now. And we're going to go on to uh, see a bit and find out a bit more about what's happened to Lydia. So Lydia is having an allergic reaction, as most of you correctly diagnosed. And this type of allergic reaction is, uh, so you can have all sorts of different allergic reactions like hay fever or asthma or hives on their own. And they're nasty, but they may be not life-threatening. But this reaction that Lydia is having, having is affecting a whole body and it's called anaphylaxis. It's very severe and people can die from anaphylaxis. It's caused by different, um, by an allergic reaction to different proteins. So it might be a food like peanuts or shellfish or nuts or eggs. And we know now that people are very careful with labeling food. So people with allergies can try and avoid things they're allergic to. But you can also be allergic to insect stings or bites or latex or even some drugs themselves. And things that you're allergic to are known as allergens. 
here's a patient showing some of the features of anaphylaxis that Lydia has. Um, swollen eyes, lips and tongue, and I'll explain why they're swollen in a minute. Fast heart rate, stomach ache or vomiting, the blotchy hives that I was talking about, and wheezing, cough or difficulty getting air. And patients can also have confusion, uh, headache or loss of consciousness because they have low blood pressure and so not enough blood is getting to their brains. So let's think now about the science. So when you study clinical pharmacology, the first thing you have to do is understand the science of what's gone wrong, the pathology, so that you can then uh, do something about it, the pharmacology. So peanuts or any of those triggers that I mentioned, uh, we call them allergens. And allergens are things, so our, our immune system is set up to identify and resist infection. And allergens, if you like, are recognized by the immune system as if they were an infection, but they aren't. And so that can then lead to a harmful, harmful reaction rather than a good reaction. So I suspect most of you are scientists or year 12 scientists, so you probably know already about the white blood cells, which are part of the immune system. And one type of white blood cells called the B cells makes antibodies. And what antibodies are, are like little magic bullets that you can shoot at bacteria, making holes in them, they leak, they die, they are tagged for recognition by the rest of the immune system. So when we come, when the white blood cells come up against an allergen, if you're someone who does develop an allergic reaction, and most of us don't, what happens is that instead of making antibodies to an infection, you make antibodies to an allergen. And these are called IgE antibodies because they're um, allergic antibodies rather than IgG antibodies, which are in anti-infection antibodies. And these um, white bloods, these antibodies become attached to some cells called mast cells. And these mast cells uh, are part of the immune system. And inside them are these little granules, which are like little sacs. And they contain something called histamine. And again, hopefully a lot of you have heard of that because you might have heard of patients taking antihistamine tablets or even have taken them yourself for hay fever. So here we are now with what we call sensitization. The mast cells have IgE on them, but nothing will happen until we come into contact with the peanut again. And this time, when we come into contact with the peanut, the allergen, the little fragments of peanut protein that get into the system, uh, now are recognized by those antibodies. And this causes cross-reaction between the antibodies, which then causes the mast cells to leak and do this thing called degranulating, which basically just means they chuck out their granules. And once they degranulate, the histamine is out there in the blood. And histamine is a very a strong mediator which causes blood vessels to open up or dilate. Uh, and so uh, blood is rushing through the blood vessels and it also makes them more leaky. This could be good if you have an infection because it brings in the immune system to fight off the bacteria, but it can be bad if it's your whole body and all your blood vessels are leaking. Uh, and you can imagine that that is why you get all of the problems of anaphylaxis. So let's look at that. So this is what histamine does in anaphylaxis. It causes dilated leaky blood vessels in the lips, here's a patient with a really swollen lip. And if you imagine their tongues like that as well, it's going to be hard to breathe. Um, it causes um, not just leaky blood vessels, but it also histamine causes spasm of the airways like an asthma attack. And that's what makes them wheezy. And when all the blood vessels are open, uh, there's nothing to keep the pressure up. So when the blood vessels open, um, if you like, they're, they're relaxed, the blood, it, there's a bigger volume for the blood to sit in, so the pressure is lower. Those of you who are physicists will get that. And so blood pressure is low, you haven't got enough blood going to the brain, you get confusion, clammy and sweaty, and this fast, weak pulse, your heart is trying to pump blood around the body to make up for the low blood pressure, uh, but the pulse is weak because the blood pressure is low. And you can imagine if this is really serious, the airway blocks, no oxygen gets into the brain, the blood pressure is really low, uh, then um, potentially it's life-threatening. If you've got questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. 
Okay, so just to see if your chat buttons are working, anybody know what drug we use to treat a, a severe allergic reaction? Just type a name of any drug that you think might be useful into the chat. Maybe even some of you carry this with you. Brilliant, so I can't let me see who someone's come in here. Adwa, um, I can't see all my chat. Maybe I'm really got, I need to look at something. Tammy, epinephrine, Heba, Patrick, adrenaline. Uh, they're also quick antihistamines is a good suggestion. Pyriton, adrenaline, Hodson. Um, sorry, I can't see the names very well. I don't know if I've got this on wrong. Uh, but um, uh, Jude, antihistamines, uh, Kawaja, EpiPens, um, Biran, Biran, Biran uh, EpiPen, brilliant. Uh, absolutely, fantastic. I said already that the NHS is in safe hands. So these are great answers. Let's have a look. So the immediate treatment for um, anaphylaxis, as most of you have pointed out, is adrenaline. And so now we need to look at how adrenaline is going to help our patient, to help Lydia when we give it to her either via an EpiPen, which we'll look at in a minute, or by another route in A&E. Um, this is called pharmacodynamics, which basically means how drugs work or what they do to the body. So adrenaline is actually something we all make in our body from our adrenal glands. It's a natural hormone. When we use it as a medicine, obviously we inject it. And adrenaline um, works by, um, when, it's, when it's circulating, it sticks on these things called receptors. And receptors basically um, find the adrenaline and once the adrenaline is bound to the receptor, which is a protein sitting across a cell membrane, this causes something called a conformational change, the, rece the receptor change shape. And this then sets off a series of reactions in the cell called a cell signaling pathway. And these receptors are in the blood vessels, they're in the heart, and they're in the airway. And you can see that when they're stimulated by the shot of adrenaline, they cause the smooth muscles, which are the muscles in the blood vessels, to contract. Uh, they cause um, uh, the heart muscle to contract, and they also cause the airways to open. So this is really good because for Lydia, she's got dilated leaky blood vessels and contracted breathing tubes. Adrenaline will reverse that. It will constrict the blood vessels, make them less leaky, and it will um, relax the breathing tubes. And so it will help immediately save her life while we sort out the allergic reaction. So we're going to give adrenaline. So I'd like you to have another, do another poll for me. How do you think we should give adrenaline? Do you think we should give it as an inhaler? Do you think we should give it as an injection? Do you think maybe we could put it on as a skin patch? Do you think we should give it as a suppository? which is where we put it into the bottom, into the rectum, or do you think we should give it as a tablet for Lydia in this life-threatening situation? So I'm gonna give you guys a minute to vote. I've already got a fairly strong majority, but a few votes for most things. Nobody's chosen suppository, so I think that's probably very reasonable. It can be useful, but I think definitely not in this case. Okay, I've got about 75% of the people have voted. I'll give you another 10 seconds. I think I can see what the result's going to be there. Okay, closing the poll now and sharing the poll. So fantastic, most of you have said injection, which is absolutely right. In a life-threatening emergency, we want the drug in the body as quickly as possible so that it gets to the blood vessels and the airways and saves Lydia's life. We could give it as a, well, we could potentially give it by another route. We, uh, yeah, I'm sure the patient's grateful too, Martina. Um, we could give it uh, by a tablet, but the problem with um, natural hormones is that they're proteins. And if you imagine swallowing a protein, you digest it, so it doesn't get into the blood. Um, Sirakuma asks, what's a suppository? And the answer is, it is a type of medicine that you put into the rectum uh, when somebody can't swallow or is vomiting. And it's very commonly used, uh, for example, uh, if people can't eat and drink. 
Um, and hopefully that's answered. Uh, sorry, it's Anita, sorry, that was, I, I've opened my chat now so I can see your names. Um, we could, we do give medicines through skin patches and inhalers, but again, in this situation, and, then we, and proteins like insulin, for example, can get round the body or uh, skin patches can be used for nicotine, for example. But in this case, it's not just about getting the drug into the body, it's about getting it in quickly. And you guys, as I said, have suggested very well that we should use uh, an injection. So this slide just um, starts to think about what is pharmacokinetics. And so it's no good if a drug works if you can't get it where it's needed. And pharmacokinetics is all about getting the drug into the body and getting it to where it's needed at the right time. So some of it is about administration, and I'll talk through this slide in a minute. But then once the, it's, some of it's about distribution, about the drug moving through the body to the target. And then as soon as you give someone a drug, they start getting rid of it. Their liver breaks it down and their kidneys excrete it. And that's called ADME, absorption, distribu distribution, metabolism and excretion. And getting the right amount of drug to the target for the right length of time is a real art form in, in medicine's development uh, to get the right balance between giving the drug uh, and it being metabolized and getting to equilibrium so you have the right amount of drug. This slide shows some ways we can give medicines. So we can give them as tablets, which is the most common way, about 90%. Uh, people can inhale their medicines, for example, particularly useful if you've got a trouble with your breathing, like asthma. Um, we can give it topically, which means we can um, put it to where it's needed, like dripping it into the eye or in the nose or the ears or wherever it's needed, or creams. And we can also use the skin to give, get drugs into the blood. So this is a, a lady wearing a nicotine patch. We can do that with hormones uh, and some other medicines, painkillers. Um, but for Lydia, we want to inject the medicine. So the question is where? And here you can see a layer of skin with subcutaneous tissue and fat and muscle at the bottom. And basically you can see that the steeper the needle, the deeper you go with the injection. You can inject it into the skin, intradermal, into the fat, subcutaneous, into the blood, intravenous, or into the muscle. And with um, shot, anaphylactic shot, we stick the adrenaline straight into the muscle. And the muscle has a really good blood flow, so it take, gets the adrenaline straight into the bloodstream. We could go intravenous, but it just takes too long to find a vein and get a cannula in, by which time Lydia might have got sicker. So here's the treatment of anaphylaxis. So for Lydia, we give intramuscular adrenaline. And those of you who said an EpiPen did very well, here's an EpiPen. This is something we give to people with known anaphylaxis so that they can take, carry them around. And then if they become unwell, like this poor girl here, somebody, um, a passerby or a relative or a friend can actually give them an intramuscular injection, usually into the thigh where there's a good muscle. Uh, and uh, save their lives while they're waiting for the ambulance. Now, those of you who say antihistamines, I think you're budding pharmacologists because the adrenaline people did brilliantly, but the antihistamine people were thinking about the mechanism of the um, uh, reaction. The histamine was actually the problem. The only problem with giving, so we do give antihistamine and we give it after the adrenaline because we want to give it into the vein. So we need the patient to be stable so we can then get a cannula in, a, a plastic tube, so we can put medicines into the vein. Uh, and also it doesn't work as quickly as the adrenaline. So if we just use the antihistamine, we might not save life, but antihistamine will block that histamine effect and will give us a longer benefit. And we also use this thing called steroids, corticosteroids, which are anti-inflammatory, which settle down those itchy mast cells uh, and give us longer benefit against the uh, anaphylactic reaction. And then there's a whole lot more work to do, but we're on the life-saving bit today, and I'm aware that I'm going on, so I don't want to keep you here all night. Um, so we're not going to talk about Lydia further, but the next thing we need to do is find out why this happened and work out what to do to stop it happening again, or to make sure that she and her family know what to do if it does happen again. So we're going to move on now to Shikelu, who's a 68-year-old man, and he has a pain in his chest. It's sudden onset, you can see it's in the middle of his chest, central, and it describes it as crushing, like there's an elephant sitting on his chest. 
He's also feeling pain in his jaw and down his left arm. He's very sweaty and nauseated and he's having a bit of trouble breathing. So I know that I've got an ACE diagnostic squad on the, on the call. So what do you think is wrong with Shikalu? The Shikalu, do you think this is an allergic reaction or an asthma attack or a um, choking? Has he got food stuck in his windpipe? Is it a heart attack or for Shikalu, is it a punctured lung? What do you think might be making him um, have this uh, sudden onset central crushing chest pain like an elephant sitting on his chest with pain in his jaw and left arm, uh, sweating and nausea and difficulty breathing. And this is what we do in the hospital all the time is we make a differential diagnosis. We don't necessarily say it's got to be this so it can't be anything else. We think what's the most likely diagnosis. So what do you think is likely in a 68 year old man with sudden onset pain is his biggest problem. We think about the most likely diagnosis, but we might have some other options uh, that we have as a sort of second line um, set of choices that we want to rule out. So making the diagnosis is a key part of patient assessment. So I'm going to close the poll and share it with you. And you can see that this time, 80% of you have gone for heart attack. 11% uh, are a bit worried he's got a punctured lung. It's a good suggestion. It's lungs are in his chest, near the heart. It's a good suggestion. And then there's a small smattering of people worried about choking, asthma, or an allergic reaction. So let's now um, have a look at um, Shikalu and what's happened to him. So in this case, and it's good to have a differential, but in this case, those of you who said heart attack uh, are on the money. So let's now, again, as we like to as pharmacologists, uh, make sure we understand the science before we get on to the treatment. So a heart attack is basically damage to the heart caused by a blocked artery. As you all know, as um, budding scientists, arteries are the muscular tubes that take blood from the heart to the organs and supply organs with oxygen and glucose and all the things the cells need to survive. As we all get older, this condition called atherosclerosis develops, which basically means hardening of the arteries. And as the arteries, which are normally like muscle, muscly springy tubes, as they get harder, it's harder for the blood to flow through them. And um, since you're all young, it's a good time to know the things not to do to try and avoid this disease. It's caused by tobacco smoking, having a high cholesterol or high blood pressure or diabetes. It does run in families and it's more common in men early on uh, because to some extent, female hormones protect women from atherosclerosis. And what you can see is that the atherosclerosis means that you get basically fatty deposits in the artery. Uh, and I think it comes from the uh, Greek or Latin for a theories, which means porridge. It looks like porridge down the microscope. And you get this porridgey stuff in the walls of the blood vessels. And if that gets ruptured or damaged, you then get a blood clot on top. And if you get a blood clot on top, the artery blocks completely. And if here we've got a heart, picture of the heart with arts, coronary arteries taking blood to the heart muscle. And if this blockage occurs here, all of the arteries down here don't get any blood. So this purple heart muscle is not getting any blood. And the longer that goes on, the more likely those heart muscle cells are to die and the heart to become damaged. And that's a heart attack. And it presents exactly as Shikalu is experiencing the central crushing chest pain and a sort of reaction of panic with uh, nausea and sweating and feeling absolutely terrible like you're going to die. So how do you think we know how to treat heart attacks? Uh, do you think that we know because, again, these are all in alphabetical order. We've done clinical trials in people, we've tested drugs in people with heart attacks. The experts just know, they worked out what to do and they just decided that's what we do. Past experience, do you think it comes from trial and error in healthcare? Do you think public opinion is really important? Um, I, I suppose past experience and trial and error are given us two examples. So which ones do you think would be the best way uh, for healthcare practitioners to work out how to treat heart attacks? I must say you're a fantastically 
good responsive audience answering my polls. I'm deeply grateful. And it means I know you're out there. You've got 15 seconds to vote. Slightly less people voting on this one. Either you've gone for a cup of tea or you're not sure, but it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. So vote for something. You've got five seconds. I'm going to close the poll. Still a pretty good vote, 70%. Thank you very much. And I'm going to share it with you. So this time we've got a bit more of a split, although still um, two thirds have gone for clinical trials. And there's some faith in past experience, trial and error and the experts uh, as well. But nobody thinks public opinion is the best way to treat heart attacks. Who knows? Maybe it is. Uh, social media is a wonderful thing. OK, so let's find out what the answer is. So um, those of you who said clinical trials are absolutely right. The medicines that we have for use in healthcare have been developed and tested in these things called clinical trials over since, since medicines were have started to be developed in the sort of modern era, which I guess goes back about 100 years when one of the first drugs to be developed was insulin um, a long, long time ago. I can remember it, but you lot probably can't. So what, how do we develop new medicines? And again, this is really in the news um, now with the COVID vaccines and COVID medicines. So we have this sort of fairly similar process for all medicines. And often they're discovered or they are um, uh, discovered in the lab. Uh, somebody has an idea, they test it in the lab. Um, maybe uh, they, there's a whole range of places that ideas come from. But the first thing we do is test the medicine in the lab, maybe on cells, uh, to see does the drug work. In pharmacology, there is always some animal testing. There always is because imagine putting a drug into a healthy person for the first time, having no idea what it's going to do and whether it will be safe. And there was a disaster around 10 years ago now called the Northwick Park disaster, where a medicine was put into healthy people too quickly without the proper pre-testing and uh, I think something like six to eight young, healthy young men ended up on intensive care. So we, animal testing is very contentious, but used carefully and using it as little as possible uh, for the specific experiments to check if the drug is safe to try in humans, it can be very useful. This is called the first in human bit, the very first time a new molecule is put into people. And it's usually done in healthy people who have healthy kidneys and livers and um, can withstand the effects of drugs. And it's usually done at tiny doses to start with. And then the doses increase to see how safe it is. So safety is the most important thing at the beginning of the development of a new medicine. And then we need to work out how much to give. Once we've done all of that, then the drug goes into people with, the, with disease for the very first time. And now we want to know if it works. And is it still safe when we get patients with disease who tend to have, for example, weaker liver and kidneys than people without disease? And then once we know it works in people with disease, we then go into a big trial called a randomized controlled trial. And here you can see the phase one studies are in tens of patients. The phase two studies are in hundreds and the phase three are usually in thousands. And only when all this huge, massive portfolio of evidence has been collected, do we license, does the medicine then go to something called the MHRA, uh, who's a licensing body who says, looks at all the evidence really carefully and says, yes, it can be used. Uh, and then once it can be used, it's given uh, to patients in healthcare. And we still keep an eye on it through something called the yellow card scheme and pharmacovigilance. We're vigilant about drugs uh, to make sure it's still useful and safe when used in a larger population. So that's the process of drug development. And we know what to do about heart attacks because people have been doing trials uh, in patients with heart attacks for a very long time. And when they say they're doing trials, they, it's not that they're giving the people in the trials no treatments. Usually they get the best treatment that we know to give plus an extra thing. Uh, and then that's so it goes on. So we gradually know how to treat heart attacks better. And you can see this trial for aspirin was actually done in 1988. That's when I qualified as a doctor. I remember patients going into these trials um, and they tested aspirin against 
um, a placebo, a dummy pill, to see what it would do for patients with heart attack. I won't go into the data in too much detail, but that's something you need to study if you do pharmacology. And what you can see is this is called a survival curve. So you can see that they followed the patients for 35 days uh, to start with, and they looked at how many people died. And they looked at people who uh, were taking a sugar pill compared to people who were taking aspirin in addition to the normal care. And you can see that 11.8% of people or over a thousand people in the sugar pill group had, a heart, had died of a, uh, after their heart attack, but only 9.4% of people taking aspirin. So only still a lot of people, 804 people out of these 17,000 people but it, it was better if you had aspirin than if you had placebo. 35 days doesn't seem very long, so they followed them up. You can see they saw them again up to two years later, and you can see that this time it's the other way up. Here it's the people that died, and here it's the um, people who survived. And you can see this is cut off this axis, so it's still 80% of people. And you can see that being on aspirin was better. So that's how we, find out what to do. So we need to give Shikelu an aspirin, as simple as that. If you think someone's having a heart attack, go in the bathroom cupboard and get an aspirin, and that will perhaps potentially um, get them on the road to saving their life. And it's easy and quick to do. So big question is, how do clinicians keep up? So I, I looked this up for you guys, and I discovered that there's an estimate, and there's my reference, that there are around 50 million journal articles published since time began, which was when I started studying. And can you imagine reading one article, let alone 50? So 50 million. So it really is absolutely overwhelming. And so managing and curating information is an industry in itself. And by curating, I mean telling clinicians what, what's useful, what's not useful, uh, helping them understand how um, they can use information to help patients. And so one of the bodies that does this is NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And they've come into being in the late 90s while I was a doctor. And I remember before and after, and they've made revolutionized healthcare because what they've done is made a standard way of managing things. And here's the NICE guidelines for heart attacks, which are also called acute, uh, it's coronary heart syndromes. And you can see the initial drug therapy Acute STEMI is a type of heart attack. Give them a single loading dose of aspirin as soon as possible. So back to, we've got evidence for going in that bathroom cupboard and getting the aspirin out if we think someone's having a heart attack. So what happened to Shikelu? Well, he got his aspirin, 300 milligrams immediately, but that wasn't enough because he's got a blocked artery, so he needs that unblocking. So he went straight to something called the cath lab, where they do this thing called coronary angiography and intervention. What they do is they put um, a tube into the artery and they feed up this thin wire, guide wire, and they put it through the blocked artery and it's got a balloon on it. And so they sit the balloon in the blocked artery and they know they're in the right place because they put a little bit of dye on. That's what angiography is. It means graphy means drawing or it allows you to visualize the arteries because they're full of dye. And then when they're in the right place, they blow up the balloon, which opens the artery. But if they just then let the balloon down again, the artery would reblock. And so what happens is when they take the balloon, when they block the balloon, they expand a stent, which is a, a mesh um, tube that keeps the artery open, uh, compresses the plaque, and then when they take the wire and the balloon out, the artery is open, blood is flowing through, taking fresh oxygen and sugar to the heart muscle. And if you do it soon enough, you can stop the heart muscle dying, and the person can make a good recovery as Shikelu did. I've put here again for the interest of time, secondary prevention and discharged home, because we need to make sure he stops smoking, gets his cholesterol down, all sorts of different, he probably go home with a big packet of medicines, having not been on any before, to stop him having another heart attack uh, and save his life in the future. But we haven't got time for that today. So I'm coming to the end of my talk now. And really what I've illustrated, I hope, is, the, is what clinical pharmacology is and what it does for patients. So it's about understanding the mechanisms of disease, like we did for anaphylaxis and heart attack, discovering new medicines. We didn't really do that today, but discovering them and testing them in the lab and sometimes in animals, 
before we put them into humans for the first time. And then doing proper trials so that we know that they're safe and effective, uh, and then getting them licensed before we prescribe them for patients. And it's a cycle because as soon as we find one treatment, we find a new question or problem. And you can see if you study Clin Farm, you will obviously study some science, but you'll also find out all about how drugs work, how the ADME, how drugs are handled by the body, uh, how drugs are developed, understand those graphs and data, and how they're used in patients. And really importantly, our degree is very hands-on and it's all about developing people to be ready for work. And you learn a lot of clinical trial skills, laboratory skills uh, to be part of that um, uh, team that is making these new medicines. So I'll just finish by hoping that I've convinced you that the A&E team is bigger than just the doctors and nurses on the front line and that there is a job out there for anybody who's interested in science, whatever their thing, whether they're a hot frontline person, whether they're more a thoughtful person or a data person or a people person, uh, there are jobs in um, science, drug development, healthcare for all you guys. And actually, you're all hired after your brilliant performance on the polls. That brings me to my questions, um, Jacob. And I've put my email address um, on the final slide. I'd be very pleased to hear from you if you want to email me. And I've also put the website for our BSC if you want to find out more. But please, please feel free to email me if you'd like to um, subsequently. I'll stop talking now and let Jacob lead the question. Thank you so much, Emma. That was um, super interesting and really wonderful to see the kind of full journey of these two patients there. Um, we've had a lot of questions come through um, as you've been speaking. I've tried to pull out the ones that kind of hit as, as many, cover as many people's questions as possible. Um, but please do keep sending your questions in. And, and if we don't get to them, as I say, we will come back to you by email after. Um, so I the, show my screen for a minute and then... Um, yeah, that would be really helpful, actually. Yeah. Cheers. So the first question we had um, was about talking about Lydia's symptoms, obviously our first patient. Um, we had a question around how much time you would have before you you had to get that adrenaline into, into her and if that, um, I guess, yeah, how much flexibility you had before you get that to her. That's a brilliant question. So basically the quicker the better um, because, it's, and again, Medicine is an art, not a science, because it's there's so many nuances. The sicker she is, the quicker you need to be, um, because you need to get her blood pressure back up and her blood going to her brain and her oxygen levels, um, your oxygen getting into her blood as well. So that's why we give people in the community EpiPen, so they can actually get the adrenaline as soon as the anaphylaxis occurs. Um, so the sooner the better. But if we don't manage to do that, then and also probably in a real situation, she'd have had it in the ambulance if she didn't get it if she didn't get it at home. But obviously, this is a teaching situation, so we, and we want it to be at about A and E. So I would say the quicker the better. Um, but that doesn't mean it's all over for Lydia if she doesn't get adrenaline um, as soon as possible. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Emma. Um, we had another one um, about the injections and how we get the drug to where we want it through the different layers of skin. Um, we had a question, if you would use the same syringe at varying angles, or if there's any opportunity or any instance when you would use a different syringe, um, or is it always the same, the same syringe? So that's a great question. So I'll start with a needle and then I'll go on to the syringe. So the needle is um, different sizes. So you if you if anybody uses insulin, that's a very small needle that only goes into the fat. So it's short and it's little because we don't need to get loads of thick drug through it. And we want to cause as little pain as possible. Whereas for the um, intramuscular injection, we need a longer needle. And usually it's a little bit bigger to get the drugs quickly into the muscle. In terms of the syringe, the syringe size is dependent on how much drug you want to give. So if you want to give a small volume, you use a small syringe. And if you want to give a bigger volume, you give a bigger syringe. So again, subcutaneous would be a small volume and intramuscular might be a bit bigger. Uh, but um, in the EpiPen, it's not really a syringe. It's a preloaded thing because we don't want people at home having to draw up drugs into a syringe with a needle. Basically, the EpiPen comes 
um, ready. It's a, a tube with a drug in it with a needle on it and you prime it and stick it in and press. So uh, it very much depends on the healthcare setting and the, uh, exactly what you want to inject and, to, and where. That's no, the question. Thank you, Emma. Great question. Uh, there was an, uh, a question on um, the application of placebo, um, and we had quite a few people asking around, is this legal and is it ethical to use a kind of, um, I think you call it a sugar pill? What a brilliant question. Um, another brilliant question. So a clinical trial uh, the most important thing in the clinical trial is that people are in, who are going into the clinical trial are in it voluntarily and they have to be in it with the full, their full knowledge that they're in a clinical trial and they have to give something called consent. So they have to understand what the trial involves, including the chance that they may get a sugar pill and they have to um, agree to be in that trial in the full knowledge that they may get a sugar pill and they have to sign something. And so in those situations, it's perfectly legal and ethical to give a sugar pill. Now, we would only ever give a sugar pill if there were as, as a to because the placebo effect. So if, if I give you a sugar pill, you will probably get something will get better. A pain might go away or your blood pressure might get better, even though it doesn't have any medicine in it. And that's called the placebo effect. So when we do a trial, we need to put a placebo in, otherwise we don't know if the medicine's really worked or if it's just the placebo effect. But we wouldn't just say, let's say someone had cancer and we already had an effective treatment. We wouldn't stop the effective treatment and just give them sugar. Uh, it, it's usually added on to what, what we already do. So in 1988, we didn't know how to treat heart attacks at all. In fact, when I started as a doctor, it was seven days bed rest. So at that point, it was perfectly ethical to test aspirin against a sugar pill. But no one would do that now because it would be a totally unethical to not give anybody the, all the effective heart attack treatments that we have. So if we were going to test a new treatment for heart attack, we would test it against the current best practice. But we might use a sugar pill so that to do something called blinding, which means that the patient doesn't know if they're on best treatment plus a new medicine or best treatment plus a sugar pill. I hope mm. that answers the question, but it's a brilliant question. And I think I'd want to reassure you that no clinical trials would ever be done in certainly in this country and probably worldwide uh, without patients consent, just giving them sugar pills. Um, it's uh, there's something called good clinical practice, which is a very strict set of regulations that make sure clinical trials are done to strict ethical standards. Thank you, Emma. We had quite a lot of questions on that, so hopefully that's that's answered that for the Brilliant individual. Question. Um, we had also uh, one that was, I guess, um, related was how much, how sorry, maybe not so related, but talking about kind of drugs. How do you work out how much of a drug to actually give someone? I imagine it's a very complicated procedure, but. Can you guys just come and do the course, please? Because you're answering such brilliant questions. You make me very happy. Um, that is an amazing question. How do we know how much drug to give? So yeah, that's what that's all part of the clinical trials process. So we get the first idea of the sort of strength of drug we're going to need to give to get our benefit from our testing in the lab. Uh, and then when we go into humans for the first time, it depends how dangerous the drug is. But we usually do these things called dose escalation studies, where we start at the tiniest possible dose, uh, and then we give slowly give people a little bit more and a little bit more whilst we're monitoring for the safety first, because hurting people mustn't happen if it's a humanly possible to stop it, and then efficacy. And so we basically do this dose escalation study, and we keep going until we've got the dose that gives the biggest effect for the fewest side effects. And then that dose goes forward into the next stage of clinical trials. Maybe one or two doses go forward uh, for comparison. And so it goes on. But it's all about that clinical trials process, working out the right dose. And that's a big role for clinical pharmacologists in drug development. But a brilliant question. We've um, had a few questions come in about the kind of the course, I guess, more specifically. Um, so first one. Is this degree more similar to a chemistry or biology degree? Um, and on the back of that, 
do do you have had to study either of those subjects to come and study at uh, clinical pharmacology at St George's? So it's more similar to a biology degree in that we study um, the biology of physiology and uh, pathology and a bit of anatomy all about how the body works and then there are drugs there are chemicals in terms of drugs but we don't really study the chemical structure and the formulation we study how they work how humans handle them and then how they're developed so I would say if you love biology you'll love the degree and if you love chemistry you'll get a lot out of it but it's not as pure chemistry um, you have to have either biology or chemistry but you don't have to have both and it doesn't matter which one you have but our students find that if they've done biology I think we had some students who didn't do biology and they did feel it, it took them a while to catch up but they still caught up and um, for everyone watching if you if you want to look at those entry requirements in a bit more detail if you pop onto the course page like I talked about at the start of the webinar um, all those entry requirements are on there for um, this year coming and next year I believe and you can always ask me if you're not sure you can always send me an email I'd love to hear from you and I'll put my slide up again at the end so you can copy it down if you want. Okay. I would say if in doubt ask because you never know. Another question that is linked to kind of the course. Um, the topics we talked about today, would we be would students cover those in first year of study on the course or uh, kind of uh, and develop that knowledge or is it something they would pick up later on? Another fantastic question. So our degree is very integrated. So rather than having to study all the science at the beginning and then get to the interesting bits at the end, I mean, I'm sounding like I'm a bit biased there, um, mm -hmm. students will study this stuff right from the beginning. So we have um, our timetable would look a little bit more like a school timetable than a university timetable in that you study six, sounds, I don't want to scare you, but you study six subjects at once. You study the science, the pharmacology, pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, the drug development, the drugs in healthcare, and the data and statistics all at once. Now, that doesn't mean you get massively overwhelmed with content, but what it means is it's integrated. So when you need to know about the heart, you learn the science of the heart, the pharmacology of the heart, about patients with heart disease, and how drugs are developed for the heart. So it's all coordinated. So you do the interesting stuff right from day one, and pretty much from day one, you're doing lab skills and clinical trial skills, um, and our patient, our students, our first years already, we're at the end of the first term, have learned how to measure vital signs, how to tell if someone's alive, they've done a trial, they've done drug administration, so they've done all that cool stuff already. Um, and uh, as well as that, at the end of every week, we have something called drug-based learning, and that's a, a real-world scenarios from healthcare, from um, uh, the lab from clinical trials where you can apply your knowledge that you've learned in the previous week to real um, scenarios and situations. So it's all about learning to apply your knowledge and you'll see all the way through there will be case studies, patient scenarios right through from the first part of the course. Thank you. We've had lots of lots more questions coming as you're talking so we will make sure we come back to you all. Just wanted to end with one final one um looking post uh university and kind of careers um someone asked a question around in the instance of a and e where is the clinical pharmacologist based are, are they in the kind of a and e ward or are they in a, in a lab how, how, how does that work that's a fantastic question so i guess what i was doing in my slide was trying to my a and e slide was trying to make you know, trying to show you, it really frustrates me, and I am a doctor, that when I was at school and my career's advice was basically doctor or teacher, and that, I'm sure it's got better, because uh, education has got better than when I was an old, a young lady, but um, I do think that there only are certain things that you can, be, you are shown and you can see when you're, when you're young and you're thinking about what you want to do, and out there is just, I wanted to give you a flavour of the raft of different things that you could get involved in. And from our degree, so many different things you could do um, in a springboard, some of it. So the students that are graduating this year, some of them are going on to do more study, like a master's. Some of them want to go and do healthcare degrees. Some of them are going to work in industry or clinical trials. Or so There's a whole range of things you can do. So there's something out there for you, out there for you even if you're not sure what it is you want to do. And 
Um, this, I think this degree allows you to see a whole smorgasbord of options. Um, so that's what that was part of it. So where would you actually be? So as a clinical pharmacologist, you would probably actually not be anywhere near a &E, to be brutally honest. You would be maybe in a clinical trials unit. So we have a clinical research facility on the ground floor here. Patients coming in all the time to do trials, so you can be patient facing. Or you might be in a pharmaceutical company somewhere, you might be in a lab, you might be managing data, so you wouldn't be on the front line. So if you want to be a frontline healthcare person, uh, you might want to do paramedic or doctor or nurse, if you want to be an A&E. But if you're interested in medicines and um, you're not sure if you want those 3 a.m. shifts, um, etc., there are loads of other things you could do that still make a massive difference and are so important to healthcare. We couldn't have healthcare without clinical trials or new medicines because well, how would we treat the patients? Thank you so much, Emma. I think it's so wonderful to um, hear the different options that are out there for students um, and to kind of make everyone aware of that. I'm um, just going to pop back on our screen here. Hopefully you can see our final slide here. Um, as Emma pointed out, she has popped her email address on there for you. So if you do have any questions, I know Emma is more than welcome to you, uh, for you to ask her then directly. We also have on here our study at email address, which show, uh, is any questions related to entry criteria or what studying is like at St. George's, you, you're welcome to contact us there, as well as our Instagram, Twitter and Facebook pages, which all have more information on. Another great resource that we have is the um, ability to speak to our current students via UniBuddy. So if you pop onto our website, you can speak to one of our clinical pharmacology students and ask them directly what it really is like to study on the course from their side. On that note, I'd like to thank everyone for joining in today. Um, thank Emma for speaking for over almost an hour. So thank you so much for um, taking all of those questions. It's a really wonderful session. Equi and the rest of the staff in the background for supporting. Um, and we'd just like to say thank you once again and ask if you could complete the short five question uh, multiple choice survey at the end of the event is really helpful for us and um, planning more of these in the future. Thank you very much everyone and we hopefully will hear from you all soon in the future. Thank you so much everybody. Bye. Bye.